Story 1 The blood procedure went on as scheduled, quietly and monotonously, as always. The donors sat in comfortable chairs, their fingers clasped, watching the crimson streams fill the plastic bags. The faint whisper of conversations dissolved into the soft hum of the equipment when suddenly one of the donors, a young man, began to panic. His fingers trembled and his eyes widened in fear. I can't, he said in a strained voice trying to stand up. Suddenly he jerked, pulling his arm away, and the needle came out, spraying blood onto the floor. Red drops scattered like tiny rubies on the white tiles. Panic spread through the room as the man continued to struggle. Dr. Renfield, a tall man with a cold gaze, and Nurse Sarah quickly rushed to him. Sarah spoke softly, trying to calm the donor, while the doctor, with professional composure, deftly reinserted the needle. But I noticed a strange gleam in his eyes, and when he thought no one was watching, he discreetly licked a drop of blood from his hand, with a smile so brief it could have been a trick of the light. Everything returned to normal, and the donors gradually calmed down. Renfield and Sarah continued their work, and I stayed behind to help with the cleanup. My colleagues began discussing the incident, trying to understand what had caused such a reaction in the donor. We were talking when Lucy, one of the senior nurses, entered the room. Her face was pale and her eyes shone with worry. There's missing blood in the storage room, she said, trying to stay calm. But her voice betrayed her concern. We all froze, realizing the seriousness of her words. Concerned and anxious, we began speculating on what could have happened. We checked all the records but found no errors. Perhaps it was just a counting mistake, but it didn't sit well with us. Dr. Renfield said that the surveillance cameras hadn't shown anything either. The day ended with this unresolved tension, and I headed home, feeling a growing sense of unease. Walking through the alleys, I couldn't shake the feeling that someone was following me. A figure in a cloak flickered in the darkness. I quickened my pace, almost running the rest of the way home. At that moment, Lucy called. Her voice was agitated as she expressed her worries about the missing blood. Who could have stolen the blood? What kind of psycho would do that? Her voice trembled with anxiety. Breathing heavily, I reassured her as I finally reached home. Locking the door, I felt a slight relief but the thought of someone outside still lingered. Trying not to panic, I checked all the locks and shutters, yet it still felt like someone was watching me, hiding in the shadows of the night. Morning came. I headed to work again. The new day washed away yesterday's anxiety, and it now seemed almost laughable that I had been so scared. The morning light filled the streets, and the city awoke, returning to life. When I arrived at work, I saw Sarah and Lucy animatedly discussing something at the reception desk. Good morning. I greeted them and headed to my office. After handling my tasks, I went out to the reception area. There were no patients yet, and in the silence, I heard the hum of the working television. I yawned, glancing around, and caught sight of the news on the screen. The news was reporting missing persons. My attention was drawn to the photos. Several of the missing people looked familiar. I frowned, trying to remember where I had seen them. Lucy, sitting nearby, was also watching the news. Suddenly her eyes widened, and she gasped, covering her mouth with her hand. My God, we've seen them. They're our patients. We exchanged looks, and I silently nodded, recalling those people. Faces, smiles, conversations flashed before my eyes. Suddenly the entrance door burst open, and a man in his forties, dressed in a formal suit, entered the reception area. He approached the desk, pulled out an ID, and introduced himself. I'm Detective Michael Hardy. I'm investigating the disappearance of people, and all of them visited your center. 
I'd like to ask you a few questions. Lucy said she was willing to answer questions, and the detective asked how many people worked in the center and wanted to speak with each of us individually. Lucy contacted Professor Renfield and got in touch with Sarah. Soon, each of us was interviewed in a separate office. I was the last one. When I entered, the detective was sitting on a chair behind the desk. I walked in and sat opposite him. He began asking questions. Do you remember these people? He asked, showing me the photos. Yes, I remember some of them, I replied. Roughly when did you see them? Did you notice anything suspicious? Where were you on such and such a day? He asked questions one after another, not giving me a break. I answered all his questions and he nodded, jotting down notes in his notebook. Finally, he set it aside and looked at me deeply, asking, Sir, many lives are at stake. Did you really not see anything suspicious? I thought for a long time, weighing my words, and decided to tell him about the incident yesterday, the missing blood bags and Professor Renfield's strange behavior. The detective listened attentively, noting down something in his notebook, and thanked me before letting me go. I returned to my duties, but thoughts of the missing people and Renfield's odd behavior kept swirling in my mind. The detective's words echoed in my thoughts. Many lives are at stake. After the detective finished questioning us, he said goodbye, leaving his contact information and asking us to get in touch if anything came up. There were still no patients, so the four of us gathered to discuss what had happened. Lucy and Sarah were anxiously talking about it, while Professor Renfield frowned silently, listening to them. Eventually, we all went back to our tasks. Around noon, while sorting out blood transfusion equipment in the storage room, I came across a small notebook hidden among old magazines. I was looking for a specification, but found something far more disturbing. I opened it and began to read. The contents made my hair stand on end. Here's part of the text that particularly stuck with me. People are like pigs. How you feed them determines their taste. If a person has lived on junk food, canned goods and sugar, modern fast foods, their blood tastes terrible. But truly healthy people, as some would say, non-GMO, their blood is wonderful. Once you taste it, it's hard to resist. The biggest problem is that it's hard to determine how the blood will taste. Biting everyone indiscriminately is not an option. Fortunately, there's always a solution. For me, it turned out to be this center. The notebook contained descriptions of various procedures that I won't mention, but it was clearly written by some psycho. Reading these notes, I felt fear and confusion. It was described so vividly, as if the person truly enjoyed the taste of blood. I discreetly slipped the notebook into my jacket and left the storage room. In my office, I immediately called Detective Hardy and told him about the find. He asked me to bring the notes to him and gave me an address. During lunch, I told my colleagues that I needed to run some errands and would be back soon. I arrived at the given address and handed the notes to the detective. After reading them, he looked troubled, thanking me for the information he let me go. Back at the clinic, I looked around at my colleagues. Who among them could be this psycho? Naturally, Professor Renfield was at the top of my list. His recent behavior had been so indicative. I decided to keep an eye on him. The next day, when I arrived at work, Sarah approached me. Her face was serious, and she spoke in a lowered voice. Listen, I haven't mentioned this before, but I've noticed some strange behavior from Dr. Renfield. I looked at her in surprise, trying to catch something more in her eyes. We exchanged glances, and I decided to tell her about my suspicions and the odd things I'd noticed. But I didn't mention the notebook. You're right, Sarah. I've noticed some unusual things about him, too. It may sound crazy, but I'm convinced he's connected to the missing blood and the people who have disappeared, I said, 
trying to keep my voice steady. We agreed that Dr. Renfield was highly suspicious and we needed to follow him. In the evening when the workday ended, we saw him say goodbye and leave the building. We quickly got dressed and followed him. Renfield walked, heading to an unknown destination. We kept a safe distance, trailing him. Soon we found ourselves at an abandoned building. From a distance, we watched as Dr. Renfield inspected it, peeking through the windows before going inside. We exchanged looks and followed him. Inside, the building looked deserted as if it hadn't been visited in decades. The floor was covered in dust and the air smelled of mold. The walls were peeling and the windows were boarded up. The faint creak of floorboards and the echo of our steps created a sinister atmosphere. We moved cautiously, trying not to make any noise. Looking around, we realized that Dr. Renfield had gone down to the basement. The stairs leading down were to the left of the entrance. We carefully descended, trying not to reveal our presence. The basement was dark, and we moved by touch, holding onto the walls. Soon we found a lit room, a locked door. We opened it and were horrified. Inside were numerous people, chained to the walls. The walls had spikes to which the chains were attached. All their mouths were gagged and many were injured, covered in blood. It was truly a terrifying sight. When we entered, Dr. Renfield was bending over one of the captives. The horror that gripped me made me shout, what are you doing? Dr. Renfield turned, his face filled with surprise and anger. But before he could say anything, I noticed that the eyes of the captives were staring in terror at something behind me. The realization came instantly. Sarah was standing behind me. I turned and was struck hard, thrown against the wall. Pain shot through my body, and I nearly lost consciousness. Lying injured, I couldn't move, but I saw Sarah standing at the entrance. Her face twisted, becoming inhuman, and she opened her mouth, hissing. Fangs protruded from her mouth. Damn, it was truly terrifying. She lunged at Dr. Renfield, knocking him to the floor. Then she grabbed his neck and bit into it. He screamed desperately and blood flowed down his neck. Sarah, or whatever she was, slowly drained his blood. I thought it was the end for us when a series of gunshots rang out. It was Detective Hardy. Bullet after bullet, he shot at the creature. It howled in fury and jumped to the ceiling. Detective Hardy kept firing. Soon, the creature escaped through a window, smashing it and fleeing outside. Detective Hardy called for backup on his radio. Soon, the building was surrounded and an ambulance arrived. Dr. Renfield was unconscious. I had also suffered a couple of broken ribs and was hospitalized. The next day, Detective Hardy came to the hospital. His face was serious and he spoke in a low voice. We searched for that creature, but we couldn't find it. I had trouble explaining this situation, but the many witnesses saved the day. I thanked him, and he left. I remained alone in the ward, staring out the window. Thoughts swirled in my head, wondering if I would meet her again, if I would be safe. At that moment, a squirrel with glowing eyes watched me from a swaying branch. Story 2 I've been living here for a couple of hundred years, ever since the lake turned into a swamp. It never changes. The same murky water with warty clumps, gurgling from its depths and releasing gases. The old lake, like any old woman, grumbles and stinks. When I feel like stopping, not getting up, and not breathing, I look at it. I remember that I mustn't become like it. The swamp is decrepit and disgusting, but I'm not. Not yet. The jagged walls of my hut have warmed up during the day. I step outside and sit on the very edge of the piece of land I call an island. It's a grand term, but in reality it's just a large clump of earth with tussocks and skyward stretching horsetails. Here and there, sedge pierces through, sharp as a blade. 
I should gather and dry it to plug the cracks in the hut for the winter. When it gets cold, I'll hide my home under a blanket of prickly fir branches and sleep inside. The swamp will guard me until spring. It never freezes. Loose clumps of ice, waterlogged, deceptively still, will swallow anyone who tries to cross, whether to or from the island. But winter is still far off. The swamp and I are like night in the moon. Black water reflects the sky in me as a pale spot. Hair like hoarfrost, eyes like transparent gems. I lean over, looking at the inky murk tangled with green algae and duckweed. It smells of mold. Underwater plants reach from the bottom, swaying in a slow dance. Sometimes they part, and you can see human bones sinking into the peat. I want to retrieve at least one and check how the swamp has polished it. Would it be suitable for beads or a comb? I used to make various beautiful things from bones, but now I'm building a bridge to the other side. The swamp has been my prison since I lost my skin. No matter how much I try to touch the water, it burns my bare flesh like fire without the frog skin. The last time, it left a scar on my hand. I can't leave the island on my own, can't break the bond between me and the swamp until the predestined comes to pass. But how will it happen if my skin is long gone? The scariest part is not understanding why it happens this way. I know the conditions, but not the reasons. So I habitually lie to myself. The swamp is angry that it's old and stinky, and I'm not. We're the same age, after all. The sun rolls behind the horizon like a golden bun. Twilight brings coolness. Thick fog rises from the swamp. Tonight is a full moon. Finally, a few hours of freedom and a chance to eat. My fingers holding the athame tremble with anticipation. First pain, then joy. You have to pay for joy, even someone like me. I wait a little longer. The moon blooms in full force, white with gray streaks, like a network of veins with ash-colored blood in them. The black abyss of the sky tells me, fall, don't be afraid. There's nowhere to fall, only to rise. I reach my hands behind my back. Clasping my fingers, I hold the atom tightly and lift it higher, so high that my muscles stretch like strings and my chest cramps. I cut myself along just below the shoulder blades once and twice. It burns. I scream like a bittern unrestrained and other forest creatures pick up the call, carrying it over the swamp from tree to tree in the thicket. Wings demand blood, like everything real. The pain trickles down my back and legs. I drop the atom into the grass, and then wings grow from the wounds and spread like sails. I soar into the sky, a gray swan. One flap and scarlet drops sprinkle the glowing in the twilight tufts of cotton grass. The flight is short, but all the more beautiful because of it. The city shines with neon, so bright that the stars in the sky are invisible. It blinds, buzzes, and beats faster than my heart. I land on the kneaded roof, not gracefully, as the feathers disappear a couple of meters before I touch down. The swan is not my true skin, so I can't stay in it for long. I tumble across the tiles, scraping my shoulders, elbows, and knees. Not good. People don't find anything attractive in abrasions and scars, and I need to be beautiful tonight. I freeze at the edge of the cornice, hissing in pain. Then, crouching, I crawl up to the dormer window. My refuge is here, in a dusty attic where swallows nest. I like their nests, built of grass and clay, like my hut in the swamp. Since I settled here, the nests have become much more numerous. The swallows sense the essence, and know that no beast will venture into this dwelling. I hear the fledglings rustling in their nests, and their parents calming them. My appearance is a good sign for them. It's still safe here. In the corner, there's a plywood box where I keep human things, and a mirror to see myself properly. 
I like mirrors too. You can't look at yourself in the swamp. I braid my hair and put on makeup. I don't know why, but human women like to paint another face over their own. Maybe if I had become human as I should have, had I not lost my skin, I would have loved it too. Because of the abrasions, I have to wear a jacket with long sleeves. I wanted an open dress. It's August, hot and humid, sweet as a kiss. Though how would I know what kisses taste like? Probably someone said so, and I remembered. You hear all sorts of nonsense from people. The suit suits me too. Those who take a closer look will want to know what's underneath. And it's not just my seemingly human body, but also a knife, sharp, long, heavy, pressed to my skin by a belt wrapped around my ribs. It won't be easy to pull it out quickly. I'll have to remove my clothes. But so be it. Let's play. Before leaving the attic, I whisper to the swallows, Sleep, don't be afraid. Morning is wiser than evening. I go down the stairs to leave the building like a human. The door slams shut behind me. There's no key, but I won't need to return. In the bar I visit for the third time, it's noisy. On a full moon, people feel like drinking, especially in the company of an unfamiliar beautiful woman. I'm beautiful, I know that. Not perfect, but they like my flaws. Thinness, sharp cheekbones, pale skin, eyes too light, almost transparent. I'm unusual. Men often like the unusual and it suits me. I sit at the center of the bar counter. Looking around, I search for a suitable target. That man who looks like a bird is here again, as he has been the previous three times. I remember him, glasses, frowning, like a rook in autumn. He sits with a glass in the farthest corner by the wall, watching me. I know that look. I smile at him and turn away. No, definitely not you. I like you, Birdman. Your soul is like mine. Dark as the night sky with a huge moon hole in the middle. You know the rules, but don't understand the reasons. Like those who used to visit me in the swamp centuries ago, offering gifts in themselves. I won't take you, won't pave the way with your bones. Sit, drown your emptiness in alcohol and be glad you're free, unlike me. And here's someone who will do. I sense him before I see him. He catches my eye, smiles. White teeth, well-groomed face, sturdy but not large, neat. The scent of cologne, bitter leather, spicy wood, almost masks the sour tinge of a prolonged party on his clothes. Life is a celebration for him, a type. Such men used to come to my swamp too. Always confident, quick to make a move, never missing a shot. Because of one like him, I lost my skin. I hate them but that makes it easier. I lower my eyes. They like it when a woman pretends to be shy. I feel the hot gaze of the man in glasses on the back of my neck. Why are you burning me, dear man, just like my swamp? If you knew who I am, you'd look differently. You're not one of those who shoot arrows at random in search of a bride. And if you were, it wouldn't matter to me now. Are you waiting for someone? The well-groomed man moves closer. I shake my head, and he immediately takes the bull by the horns, sits down, offers a drink. I agree for show, then discreetly pour the contents of my glass into someone else's, abandoned on the counter. My insides can't handle human alcohol or food. Someone like me needs a different kind of nourishment. He chatters non-stop, talking about his job. He's a big boss, of course. Then about his new car. He'll probably offer to show it soon. Good. I pretend to be interested, but I'm not really listening. They always say the same things, boasting about money and status before slipping a hand under a woman's clothes. It doesn't work otherwise. They're like rotten logs. All the strength is on the outside, and even that's fake. The comparison amuses me, and I laugh loudly. 
Let him think I'm flirting. Men like that. But the foreplay has dragged on. I glance out the window discreetly. The black tops of the trees and the edge of the sky above them are visible. The moon is leaning towards the west. Morning is getting closer. Time to act. I pretend to be hot and slide the jacket off my shoulders slightly. Just enough to show the curve of my collarbones and sharp shoulders while still hiding the scrapes from the fall. His pupils dilate. Fragility always excites them, probably because they imagine breaking it. But my fragility is external. Unlike him, I am more inside than I appear. After the fourth glass, he acts more decisively. His hand rests on my waist, slowly sliding lower. It's disgusting, but it's okay. I'll endure. Instead, I lean into him and remind him he promised to show me the car. His breathing quickens. So does mine, but for a completely different reason. I wonder if people realize how much hunger and lust have in common. It's time. We stand up and walk out of the bar. His hand already possessively rests on my hip, even pushing me forward. Hurry, hurry. I obediently quicken my pace. I also want to do everything quickly. My stomach aches. I haven't had a crumb for a whole lunar month. That's a long time, even for someone like me. The red car is parked at a distance, among the trees. I'm used to cars, but I still don't like them. Tight boxes reeking of iron and gasoline. Even horses smelled better. Don't turn on the light, I ask him. I slip off my jacket. The street lights are far away. In the darkness, my scars and scrapes are almost invisible. He agrees, collapses onto the back seat, fumbling with his belt. I climb in after him, stopping him. I push him onto his back and straddle him. I slowly run my finger along his cheek, chin, neck, calming him. He obediently freezes, closes his eyes. You're unusual, he says. You must have a lot of tricks up your sleeve. You have no idea, I reply, and this time I'm not lying. I unbutton his shirt, button by button. I touch the muscles on his chest, lingering where the heart is hidden beneath. Young, strong, healthy. Unspoiled by curses and sorrow. Just what I need. Undress, he almost orders. His breathing is rapid and shallow from tension. His bulging zipper presses against my thighs. Through the fabric I feel the pulse and heat. The flesh of a deer trembles similarly when a wolf sinks its teeth into it. I've seen it many times. How much do excitement and the fear of death have in common? There will be time to think about it. Be patient, I coo. We need to prepare. I rock slightly to find a position where he will be pinned to the seat so he can't throw me off. Sometimes they jerk and try to run. Then I start the swamp chant in the language of the wind and dry leaves. Now it's just a ritual, a tribute to the ancient times. But once the whole world obeyed our songs, I whisper words in a different language, weaving them into my breath. The rhythm mesmerizes not only the victim, but also myself. It seems the dust in the air freezes. Time stops, sounds disappear. Everything except my voice and the loud beating of a human heart. He doesn't have time to understand anything. His eyes widen in surprise when I lift my shirt, pull out the hidden knife, and raise my hand for the strike. With the last breath of the swamp song, I plunge the blade into his chest. He squeals like a strangled piglet high-pitched and raspy. My left hand presses on his larynx. My right quickly slices through skin and muscle. I'm good at this. It's as if my hands were truly made for it. By the time I reach the ribs, he's barely breathing. His head is thrown back, eyes rolled up. The car interior is soaked in blood. The knife is powerless against the ribs, so I throw it aside and break them with my hands. The ribs are thicker than my fingers, but not as strong. Werewolves are tougher than humans, after all. Here it is. 
My mouth fills with saliva and my insides with sweet anticipation. I tear the warm heart from the ruined chest and sink my teeth into it. It still seems to twitch, though its owner is already dead. Several minutes of ecstatic pleasure. Human blood burns my esophagus, warms my stomach, and viscously drips from my chin. I lick the last sticky pieces of flesh from my fingers. I feel strength and lightness, as if I could jump and fly. The scratches on my skin heal. All except those I made with the athame. I lift my head and look at myself in the rearview mirror. My eyes glow white neon, just like the city signs. I smile contentedly with blood-smeared lips, like lipstick. It was a good heart, nourishing. Enough until the next full moon. Behind me, the lit part of the alley, the porch, and the bar doors are reflected in the mirror. I can't go back there. Three missing patrons might draw attention. It's a pity. For some reason, I like this place. When the bridge is built and I no longer need to eat hearts, I'll visit it again. I must plan for the future. I see the man with glasses leaving the bar in the mirror. He lights a cigarette, looking at the sky. I should hurry, but I freeze. I want to watch him secretly. I turn, looking through the car windows. The bright lunar circle reflects in his glasses, and for a second I imagine his eyes glowing white like mine beneath them. Of course, that's impossible, but I still feel a connection, a lost path, an unfulfilled life, a mistake that cost the predestined. It happens to people too, surely. He carelessly extinguishes the cigarette against the wall and, without looking back, goes back into the bar. I sigh in disappointment. Meanwhile, the fabric of my shirt on my back is getting wet. The cuts throb and pulse with heat. I should hurry if I don't want to return without bones for the bridge. I wipe my hands carelessly, smearing blood on the seat upholstery. I need to get the body to the swamp before sunrise. In the daylight, I can't wear the swan skin, and without it, I can't cross the swamp. If I don't return by dawn, I'll turn into a pile of ash and dissolve in the wind. I try not to think about how I know this, so there's no temptation to check. Such is the fate of someone like me, cursed, lost skin. I can drive part of the way in the car. I know how. I learned by watching people. Those like him, whose heart is now digesting in my stomach, always have silly cars, not suited for forest driving, but better this than dragging. I find the keys in the dead man's pocket. A keychain in the shape of a purple bear hangs on the ring. I hope he didn't leave behind offspring that will miss him, and this toy is just a gift from a woman who won't mourn him. My instinct tells me that's the case. Men like him rarely have devoted wives willing to wait while they carouse in night bars. He did this often, I know. Who knows men better than one who eats their hearts? Maybe it's not true, and I'm lying to myself again. But it's easier this way. I move to the driver's seat. I confuse the pedals and almost hit my forehead on the glass from the jolt. Damn coffins on wheels. It's okay. I try again. Got it. I slowly drive onto the road and head towards the forest. This time I'm uneasy. Headlights of other cars flicker behind me. I keep wanting to look back as if someone is watching me. I resist. I'm driving poorly enough. The wheels keep veering to the sides. I need to watch the road. I've seen how cars crumple in collisions and what happens to the living beings inside them. Metal piercing the chest would kill even someone like me. Finally, I see a suitable spot. No more driving, it's too close to my dwelling. A weeping willow hangs over the dirt road, brushing the ground with its leaves. I park the car under the tree. Its branches will hide it. I drag the body like a wild animal with prey, 
backing away. Through the willow saplings on the roadside, two bright flashes flicker. I freeze, then sigh in relief. Someone sped past. I suppress a shudder. Am I afraid of being caught? I lie to myself again. Not at all. I don't want to kill more than necessary for survival. There's almost no blood left on the trampled grass, but I start whining softly, calling the wolves to cover the tracks. I see their eyes light up like fireflies in the forest darkness. The swamp is close. I can smell its stench. My gut clenches with an old longing. I love and hate my island in the middle of the bog. If only I could break this bond between us, finally build that damn bridge from the dead. How many more will it take? A couple of dozen? A hundred? But we don't choose our curses. They choose us. The wolves hungrily lick the grass and look in my direction. I pity them, for they are often as hungry as I am. I'd give them the corpse to devour, but I'm afraid the beasts will scatter the bones throughout the forest. And I need the bones myself. At the edge of the swamp, I stop, catch my breath, then tilt my chin to the sky and howl long and mournfully. The wolves join in their howls echoing in the night. It makes things easier. It's always easier when you don't grieve alone, but enough of that. The past can't be changed. The skin can't be returned. I carefully push the corpse into the water, drowning it with a long stick. The swamp grumbles and bubbles in discontent, but accepts the offering. Somewhere beyond the pines, the sky is growing pale. Morning in the forest is always murky white, like diluted milk. Fog snakes through the moss and hugs the trunks. My shirt is already sticking to my back, stiffened with blood. I strip it off along with the rest of my clothes. I send them to the bottom of the swamp as well. I remain naked. It's better this way, more natural. Humans don't have skins, so they invented clothes to cover themselves. I drive the stick into the silt with force, pressing the body to the bottom. Come on, my swamp. Dissolve this human flesh. Grow me a path to freedom. Let the curse release me so I no longer need frog skin or a stranger's arrow. The wolves suddenly fall silent. It's too quiet, but there's no time to think about it. Pain explodes across my back. Feathers pierce the skin. I soar as a swan barely touching my island with my feet before they turn back into legs. Dawn hides the moon and stars, painting the sky orange-pink like the side of a rejuvenating apple. I collapse in exhaustion onto the sharp sedge, tired. I wish I could sleep until the next full moon, unconscious like in winter. No hunger, no thoughts. The wounds from the wings slowly heal. I feel my skin itching, lazily scratching my back against the grass. My body is filled with languor. Moving seems impossible, but sleep doesn't come. The forest creatures are still silent. Strange. Not even the robins in the spruce thicket are singing, and they always greet the day. Something is wrong. I prop myself up on my elbows, peering into the dawn haze that lingers between the pines on the other side of the swamp. And I see the reflection of the rising sun on the lenses of your glasses. At first, I'm surprised. So it was you following me last night. The man who looks like a bird. Look at that. You've mustered up the courage after three lunar months. You weren't afraid of the dark or the wolves. You saw me drown the bones in the swamp and transform into a swan. What do you think of me now? Do you see a monster or a woman? Do you still like me as you did before? Fear follows. I rise from the ground, straighten my back, displaying my wildness and nakedness. What will you do, brave young man? I try to read your scent and the feelings hidden in it, but I can't. It becomes even more terrifying when I realize what you're holding. Not a bow and arrow, no. No one roams the forest with bows and arrows anymore. 
I've seen these things before, spitting fire and iron. The world has changed, but so have I. Could it be that the rules have changed too? You're aiming at me with a gun. You're going to shoot. The exhilaration that grips me is akin to madness. Because morning is wiser than evening, I whisper. A cuckoo timidly calls from the top of a fir tree. Another one answers. The forest comes alive. Everything falls back into place. The circle closes. So I'm no longer afraid. I laugh loudly. I close my eyes and spread my arms wide as if for an embrace. Shoot me. Let the bullet sink into the swamp. Maybe I'll catch it. Story 3. My name is Jack, and I've spent the last ten years working in a national park. My journey to this job was not easy and full of twists and turns. Initially, I graduated from the University of California with a degree in English philology, after which I worked in manufacturing for some time, servicing equipment and working on the assembly line. However, a series of family losses made me reconsider my life priorities. I left my job at the factory, used my savings to volunteer at a local botanical garden, and eventually enrolled in a seasonal school in Rangeley, Colorado. I experienced firsthand that spending time outdoors was much better for mental health than working in a dusty, windowless factory. For many years of working in the National Park, I rarely encountered anything supernatural or mysterious, although many people love such stories. However, one day I truly had to confront an unusual phenomenon. During one of my regular night patrols, as the cool air gently brushed my face while I walked between the tall pine trees, I suddenly stopped, noticing something unusual. Lights flickering in the distance were moving at an incredible speed and seemed utterly chaotic, unlike anything I had ever seen before. I watched their dance until they vanished on the horizon, captivated by their mysterious movement. These strange lights continued to appear almost every night for the next week. An inexplicable feeling that something unexplainable was happening here haunted me. After sharing my observation with my ranger colleagues, I inquired if they had encountered similar phenomena in other national parks. Their responses only deepened my confusion. It turned out that such lights had been seen in other places, but only at night and no one could definitively explain what they were. With each passing day, the mystery weighed heavier on my shoulders. I spent nights gazing into the dark sky, awaiting their return, driven by a thirst to unravel this enigma. My determination knew no bounds, and I resolved not to rest until I had investigated this phenomenon as thoroughly as possible even if it meant venturing deep into the heart of the park. Leaving camp on a cloudy morning, I felt the heaviness of the air saturated with pre-rain scents. The forest seemed to close in around me, creating a secluded space between the tall trees, their long shadows stretching across the ground. For hours, I followed faint markings, leading me until I stumbled upon a series of unusual tracks. These prints didn't resemble anything I had seen before. They belonged to a creature that walked on two legs but had unusually elongated feet, as if its owner was dragging them. With each step I took, following this path, my heart pounded harder and harder. Suddenly I came upon a horrifying sight. Before me lay the torn carcass of a deer, its body mutilated and partially consumed. Overwhelmed by a sense of horror, I nonetheless refused to retreat. Something hunted in these woods, and I was determined to find out what it was, despite the growing sense of danger. Continuing deeper into the forest, I encountered even more victims. Animal bodies, some left untouched, while others were torn apart, dismembered, or even charred. The air was heavy with the smell of death, making breathing difficult and penetrating. I couldn't shake the feeling that someone was watching me, 
like a predator responsible for these atrocities, lurking in the shadows, waiting for me to let my guard down. Despite all my apprehensions, I pressed on, firmly intent on uncovering the truth. Finally, I emerged into a small clearing where sunlight filtered through the treetops. Before me lay a scene straight out of a nightmare. The ground had been scorched to blackness, and in it were two deep pits. A chill ran down my spine at the mere thought of what had transpired here. As the sun began to set, shrouding the forest in darkness, I made the fateful decision to stay the night. Though it seemed reckless, my desire to learn what hunted in these woods compelled me to take this step. I chose a spot at the edge of the clearing, hoping to discover the source of all these horrors. The night was cold and silent, and the darkness felt almost tangible. I took cover at the base of a tree, my senses sharpened to the utmost, listening to every rustle ready to detect any signs of life. Hours dragged on slowly, and I began to doubt the success of my wait when suddenly the same lights appeared in the sky above a distant mountain peak. Their otherworldly glow illuminated the forest with a terrifying light that was impossible to look away from. The light seemed to be beckoning me, luring me closer. And despite the fear mixed with determination, I decided to follow their ethereal glow, moving towards the mountain. As I approached it, I began to hear strange mechanical sounds, resembling the grinding of gears or the hum of unfamiliar machinery. The forest seemed to shiver in response to these sounds, and the animals panicked, fleeing from the mountain and the source of these noises. My heart was pounding furiously, but I continued to move towards these mechanical sounds. The sounds grew louder with each step. The air was filled with the dense odor of smoke, the acrid scent of scorched earth and charred flesh. It felt like entering a post-apocalyptic zone where every element of the environment screamed of recent tragedy. However, my desire to uncover the mystery was stronger than fear, urging me to venture further into this ominous place. I stood at the base of the mountain aware that I would need to climb to its summit to confront the unknown. It was a daunting task, but I was too far from home to stop or retreat. The ascent proved to be grueling. The rocky slope became treacherous, made even more slippery by recent rain, and riddled with hidden dangers. After an exhausting climb to the top, with every muscle protesting from fatigue and sweat streaming down my face, I was forced to stop and catch my breath. My heart was pounding as if it wanted to break free from my chest, but I knew I couldn't afford a long rest. The strange lights continued their mysterious dance overhead, pulling me closer to the truth. Reaching the summit, I encountered a sight that defied explanation. The lights, as it turned out, were luminescent flying objects of unknown nature. They hovered in the air, emitting a strange green gas that slowly descended to the ground like deadly mist, destroying animals and scorching all vegetation beneath them. The scene below was simultaneously terrifying and mesmerizing. I couldn't tear my gaze away, captivated by this mystical spectacle. The smell of the gas was so overpowering that when it reached me my vision began to blur and my legs barely held me up. I lost consciousness, succumbing to the toxic fumes. The world around me disappeared, leaving me in a state of unconsciousness. When I woke up after the fainting spell, I felt a severe headache and noticed that it was difficult to focus. Trying to recall the events that brought me here, I found my memories blurred and fragmented, like pieces of a terrifying dream. Nevertheless, I remembered the lights those strange, otherworldly lights that had become the key to an unknown mystery. Suddenly I realized that I was no longer on the mountaintop. Instead, I found myself in dense undergrowth, lying on damp ground. The smell of the gas had disappeared, replaced by the earthy scents of the forest. 
Struggling with every movement, I discovered that my limbs were weak and barely supporting me. My mind was consumed by a single goal, to find my way back to the ranger station. I needed to share what I had seen and experienced, to warn my colleagues about the hidden threats lurking in the shadows. Pushing through the thick underbrush, my thoughts revolved around the other rangers with whom I had shared stories of the mysterious lights. I wondered if they had encountered the same as I had, and if they were searching for answers about the lights and the strange creatures haunting the park. If so, why had they been silent about it? Or perhaps their warnings had fallen on deaf ears? Or were their stories lost, whispered away into the forest's secrets? I was determined not to let my own story fade away in the same manner. Despite fatigue and weakness, I continued to move forward. As the sun began to set, I stumbled upon a narrow, winding trail. I followed it desperately, searching for any signs of civilization, any confirmation that I was heading in the right direction. The trail led me deeper into the forest realm, where shadows grew denser and more oppressive with every step. After a while, I realized I had become lost. The forest, which had previously felt familiar, now seemed alien and unpredictable. I felt that the forest had somehow changed, becoming something else. Tree branches appeared twisted like gnarled fingers reaching out to grasp me, and rustles in the bushes sounded like whispers or faint laughter. This transformation was not just physical. It seemed that the very atmosphere of the forest had become darker and more foreboding. I wondered if it was connected to what I had experienced on the mountain, or if my mind was playing tricks on me due to exhaustion and stress. Suddenly finding myself in the epicenter of an inexplicable nightmare, I began to question my true location. My gaze swept through the surrounding darkness, which seemed to come alive, extending its cold tendrils to envelop me. Anxiety grew with each passing minute. I felt like I had become prey to an invisible predator lurking in the shadows. My heart pounded furiously as I quickened my pace, trying to escape the unknown threat. A low, guttural growl reached my ears, seemingly coming from underground. Something massive crashed through the underbrush and a tree toppled not far from me, prompting me to panic and run. The growling grew louder and closer, but I didn't dare to look back, desperate to escape. The darkness closed around me so tightly that I failed to notice the steep slope in front of me. I stumbled and tumbled down, hitting the ground and rocks. The pain was sharp, but I managed to get back on my feet. The growling, to my relief, subsided. Apparently the predator had retreated. Determined to rest for a moment, I started to look around for a way out of this unfamiliar part of the forest. Gazing at the sky, I was struck by the extraordinary beauty of the stars, which seemed brighter and closer than ever before. It was the most astonishing night sky I had ever seen. However, the strangest thing was the complete absence of sounds. The forest seemed dead. There was no bird song, no rustling of leaves, no sounds of living nature. This unnatural silence filled the atmosphere with a sense of unease and isolation. I realized that it was important to remain calm and composed to find a way out of this unforeseen situation. Recognizing that the forest held many natural signs that could help with orientation, I began to carefully inspect the surrounding environment for clues on trees, in the soil, and on the ground. However, to my surprise, I found nothing useful. Everything around me appeared the same as before, and yet entirely different. As deep darkness fell, I realized that I couldn't do without artificial lighting. Fortunately, I had a LED flashlight in my pocket. Once I turned it on, the surrounding world revealed itself to me in unexpected light. Everything around me seemed strange. The trees had an unusual shape. The leaves were distorted, 
and the trunks were twisted into unfamiliar bends. Exhausted from endless wandering, I decided to take a short break to gather my strength, despite the pain in my back and legs. I knew I needed to keep moving. The surrounding world was completely unfamiliar and filled with unease. I realized that I couldn't rely on assistance and that my safety was at risk. Rising to my feet, I continued forward, trying to find a way out of this eerie forest. Every time I thought I had found a trail, it led either to a dead end or a dangerous area. A sense of despair and helplessness overcame me, with the thought that I might never escape this place. Hearing the rustling of branches and the whisper of leaves behind me, I immediately turned around and saw a huge creature in the darkness. Its silhouette resembled a bear, but it had antlers on its head, resembling moose antlers, large and imposing. My heart froze with fear, and I realized that I needed to act immediately. Instinctively, I started running. The unknown creature was chasing me, and I could feel its hot breath on my back. I knew that if it caught up to me, I would have to fight for my life with whatever means I had. I ran as fast as I could, but I felt the beast closing the distance between us relentlessly. Panic engulfed me, and I felt utterly defenseless in the face of this unknown threat. Suddenly, my legs stumbled, and I fell, hitting my head on a rock. Consciousness left me, and I descended into the darkness of unconsciousness. When I finally came to, the creature was no longer beside me. Glancing around, I tried to recall the recent events and understand my current situation. Getting up with difficulty, I surveyed the gloom surrounding me. Not knowing how much time I had spent unconscious, I felt a headache and found a small wound. Realizing that my flashlight had been lost in the confusion, I felt a greater sense of helplessness as I was left without a source of light in this insane forest. Beginning my search in the hope of remembering where I might have dropped the flashlight, I stumbled upon something entirely different. A backpack. Opening it, I found food, water, and a compass. This unexpected find filled me with both surprise and joy. However, it also raised questions. Who could have left it here? It made me think that perhaps I wasn't alone in this forest. Deciding to use the compass, I started moving in the direction it indicated, taking cautious steps to avoid getting lost in the darkness or encountering anything dangerous. It seemed like I walked for an eternity, losing hope of finding a way out. But suddenly I saw a light ahead. Approaching the light, I discovered a road in front of me. A feeling of relief and joy overwhelmed me, and I continued along the road, hoping to find help soon. After several hours of walking, I reached a small town. My condition was far from ideal. I was badly injured and exhausted, but luckily I was alive. I managed to reach the local police station, and there I learned some shocking news. First, I found myself in a different state, thousands of miles away from my hometown and the national park. Second, I had been declared missing, as my search had continued for over two months. Third, there had been a fire at my house in the woods, which had raged for several weeks. The fire had been extinguished, but some of my fellow rangers believed that I had perished in the flames. I couldn't understand how I ended up in a completely different state and what had happened to me during those two months. However, it was clear that the connection between the fire at my house and the mysterious creature and light in the forest was not a coincidence.